principles are not meant to be bent. We normally say that when it comes to principle things, we don't compromise. If it is not principle, we can, you know, we can always be flexible. But a principle thing, you don't compromise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, these are principle things. These are not meant to be ignored. So, he's telling us, leaving the principle things or the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Let us go on unto perfection. And you see, the word, the word that is used there for perfection is the same word from teleosis. I've always talked about that when he says for the perfecting of the saints. It is a word that means furnishing. It is a word that means equipping, making fit for use. It is not a word meaning when he says that, when he tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 that the fivefold is here for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry. It does not mean that the saints are going to become flawless. That is not what he was talking about. Perfecting of the saints means they are going to be equipped, furnished for use. Hallelujah. This podium is perfect. I like it. You get what I mean? But if you come here with all your spirit levels and what, you may realize that it is not perfect. But for the use that I need it, for the purpose that I, I need it, it is perfected. So the perfecting of the saints for the work of ministry, that you being perfected, you being furnished for that which Christ has called you to do. And that is why he says that we are made partakers, made meat to be partakers of this, his divine nature. That is the one who qualifies us. So he's saying that moving on from, moving on from the elementary things, yeah, uh, moving on from the principles of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. He says, let us move on to perfection. The word teleotes, that's the word teleotes. We move on to perfection. It can also mean graduation, graduating from one level to another. Graduating from one level to another. In other words, let's graduate. As important as the foundation is, I've said many times that this building, none of us came looking for of all of us who are tenants on this building, none of us came and inspected the foundation to hire this building. But the foundation is principle. It is foundation. This building would not be what it is. It, could, it would not hold five floors if it was a foundation for three floors. It could not do that. So the foundation is very important, but it is not normally what we look at. We come to the building and you look, okay, I like the way it's painted. I like the way... It like here, we, we liked because it had no pillars. Many venues we got had pillars within. So we're like, wow, for the first time we've got a venue in town with no pillars. You get what I mean? Such things. We have our own washrooms. We are not going to share. Okay, we will share. You get what I mean? We will share with other people. But uh, <laughs> hallelujah. We are not mean with our washrooms. But none of us examined the foundation. And many times that is the mistake that Christians do. We really love to move on. We like to graduate to another level without taking the foundations. Let, let's just look at all the foundational doctrines that he's talking about here. Therefore, leaving the principles of the, of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Ask a random Christian from any church, go and tell them, explain to me, the doctrine of repentance from dead works. You will be shocked. But they can explain prophecy to you. They can explain whatever. But imagine to Paul, this is number one. This is necessary. This is very important. Every believer must first understand repentance from dead works. Let, then he says, um, faith toward God. How many can explain that? Let's go on. Verse 2 of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Actually, many Christians say ours is not to judge. You get what I mean? But when you, we will get into it. When you get to the doctrine of judgment, you're going to realize that we are called to judge as, a, as children of God. You know, just from some of those statements that are thrown loosely, you realize that the body of Christ is very ignorant of even what is meant to be basic. Which other faith don't do? You know, you find a Muslim, any radical Muslim, they know their foundations. They know. They will tell you they went through Madras and they, they were taught things. They are taught foundational things. They know. 
You find a Buddhist, they say I'm Buddhist, they know. You find a Hindu, they say I'm Hindu, they know the basics. Christians move on with every exciting thing, which is aesthetics. It is like this building. They moved on with the glass windows. They liked the whatever, I don't know, the position where it is. They don't care about the foundation. And as long as you don't care about the foundation, the building is going to tilt anytime. The building is going, you told me the Swahili word is? Promoka. The building is going to promoka one day, just, it will just go down. Because the foundation is very important. Praise the Lord. But what Paul is emphasizing here is we can't stay on the foundation. It is not enough. As important as the foundation is, imagine if this building had been left at foundation level. None of us would be here. We wouldn't even bother asking the owners if they are renting. If we just passed here and saw the foundation, we would just pass. None of us would ever go into their office. You get what I mean? So God desires us to move on. To move on to perfection. To graduate to another level. But not before the foundation is established. Because if the foundation is not established, as a Christian, your Christianity is going to be shaky. You're going to be a Christian because your parents are Christians. You're going to be a Christian just because you go to church. And it is true. Many people you ask and they say, I'm a Christian. I'm called John. Didn't you see as you sent me in Pesa? You, 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 you get what I mean? When you, you, you start preaching to many of these guys, like you preach to many of the Uber guys, yeah? you will hear how they tell you, yeah, I'm a Christian. I may not say I'm born again, but I'm a Christian. There is nothing like being a Christian if you're not born again. There is no, if you're not born again, you're not Christian. Yeah. Hmm? yeah, dead works. You should rip. That, that's the Jesus tells Nicodemus clearly: unless a man be born again, you must be born again. Yeah, must. It is not like I said. It is not a suggestion. It is not a good. It is not just a an option or certain opinion. We must be born again. So it is so sad that we've gone on to many things. I'm telling you, we've been seeing things among Christians. Yesterday we were just seeing a poster with my wife and we're like, wow. There are levels we've not reached. Praise the Lord. Yeah, hey. People are, yeah. I had a pastor teaching people how to rule planets when the Bible said creation is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. So he says planets are part of creation. <laughs> so the whole service is on planets, how to rule Jupiter, how, yeah, these aliens you see in movies, it, it's an imitation of what God has called us to do, so how do you do, how, how, do, we, how, how do we deal with this life, there is, terrest they, 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 they is, there is life that is not terrestrial, it is not celestial, but it is not terrestrial, so, <laughs> Yeah. So people come from a service with very huge heads. But you know, you ask them about repentance from dead works. They don't know. Baptisms. They don't know. They know galaxies. They are, actually, they are astrologers now. And eventually you're like, it's just a matter of time. They are a time bomb. Eventually, they are going to get into things they don't know. Let me tell you, not all spectacular is from God. Yeah. It can be so supernatural and so spectacular, but it is of the devil. And for the years I've been in ministry, I've seen this. Yeah. Mm. I've seen people with that supernatural, but it was not of God. Yeah. Borderline. And you see, if you're not grounded, you can't tell it, especially if it is in the pulpit, if it's here in the stage. You cannot, you cannot tell. Real divination, prophesying accurately. And you know, you can't tell that this is the devil here. And even the person themselves, they can't tell that they yielded to the devil. And it is simple, just like Peter. Peter could not tell. It is Jesus who could tell, get behind me, Satan. Peter had just prophesied, as in he had spoken by revelation, Thou art the Messiah, son of the living God. I said, flesh and blood, I have not revealed that to you. In other words, you're prophetic. You've got it. 
and the next moment he tells him get thee behind me Satan Jesus dealt with the devil it was not foolishness it was Satan you know Jesus Jesus always rebukes them if it was unbelief if it was foolishness if it was but this time he said get thee behind me Satan something had entered Peter and so many times we, we want to move on there is a time uh, as attending services somewhere and you see there is a lot of preaching on moving on to maturity moving on to perfection moving on to maturity and you see the whole month we are dealing with that but I started asking myself we've even never been taught these elementaries because see the preacher was telling us you're just babies. Paul wants us to move on to perfection. Paul wants us to move on to maturity. Paul wants us, you can't say you're moving on to perfection, moving on to maturity, moving from the elementary things. Then it hit me that I didn't know the elementary things. But I'm also joining those who are moving on. I realize. I realize moving on from where? I realize maybe I need to dwell here for a while. Why am I in a hurry to move? Maybe the preacher has maybe the preacher is ready to move on, but I wasn't ready to move on. Very important to understand this. Praise the Lord. And that is why we're teaching them. Understand this. If if you began a church and you just taught this and church closed, you've done a very great job. Praise the Lord. Those Christians have got the foundation. People can build on that foundation elsewhere, and it will not crumble. And the Bible tells us to be careful as builders which foundation we lay, as we lay the foundation. Very important. Because others may build on that foundation. So the foundation that you established is very important. And Paul laid the foundation for the Corinthians, for all those people. And different people came and built on. And now, if you, the foundation is not laid, you're going to... Why, why do you think many Christians are confused? I was telling us about Christians hoping from here and there. And at times you listen, to, you look at Christians like, how could they believe that? But it is because they've never been established in the foundation. You know, you've been with them for so long, then you hear how, oh, pastor, the man of God told me, I'm cursed, eh, my mom did this, and it was very accurate, he even saw that. And they are shaking, and you're like, Guy Fafa Madani. Hey, Digeota. Hey, I can't be able. Eh? Eh. You know, you're like, how can they be that gullible? And you know, you don't even know how to explain to them. Because all along you've assumed they are mature. You've assumed that such things cannot shake them. But they've never been established in the foundational truths. It is just like a building. There can be a very beautiful building shining with lights and, you know, fireworks every year. Then one time we hear that building collapsed or the building is sinking. You know, as beautiful, as glamorous as it has been, it was a matter of time because of its foundation. It was just a matter of time. It was going to come down. As a child of God, that should not be your story. Praise the Lord. You should not just be history in the Christian world. Mm -hmm. When you're still alive, that is so sad. Mm -hmm. That you're still alive and you're just in the history books. You're nowhere. Anymore. That would be so sad. So, the, they are very important. And now we're going to talk about baptisms. The doctrine of baptisms. Notice that it is plural, baptisms. It's not singular. Yeah. Singular. <laughs> there are more than one baptism. Hallelujah. Is that better? Is, is more than one better? Plural, yeah. They are plural. This is confusing to many people because many times we've heard of baptism and we know it's baptism, but it says bap baptisms, doctrine of baptisms. Yeah, doctrine of baptisms. And the word baptism is the word baptizo. From the Greek, it is the word baptizo. And baptizo means to wash. 
deep or fully immersed in something or to deep to die uh, to die with color to die with color it was a word used in commerce when people had people who used to dye fabric that is where the word was used and it is believed that as the bible was being translated especially by the church in britain as they were translating it into english by that time during water baptism they were not immersing they were drawing crosses on people's foreheads so it was it was very hard now how do we translate this word how do we say immersion yet we don't do that so the word was englishized it was made baptism but there is no english word like baptism originally it is the church that changed it that brought in a word baptism it was a word of trade a word that meant to immerse to deep and so by the time you're reading as the reverend and you're translating the bible then you realize you don't do it like you mean i have to demolish all the work we've done no 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 let's make it an english word let's make it a religious word it was never a religious word it was never a christian word i'm sure if you go to greece right now and you you'll find that that's how they talk you you get what i mean yeah that's how they talk deep it when they are saying dip your bread into the tea how many love dipping bread in tea it's on laggy <laughs> it's on laggy yeah even and yeah even the rest of you you should learn repentance from dead works because you you're clearly lying i can see the bread crumbs that on your mouth they were dipped that's the, that's from dipped bread <laughs> Yesterday our daughter was deep. Is it yesterday or today dipping sausage in porridge? Yeah, and she said it was yummy. Yeah, it was very yummy. Yeah. <laughs> she set up everything in our house must be baptized. We are holy people. <laughs> Peculiar people. Yeah. So Ephesians chapter 4 verse 5 talks about one of Ephesians 4:5. He talks about one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So to many people that is very contradicting. Because we are like he talked about baptisms in Hebrews. Now Paul is saying we have one baptism. The Bible contradicts itself. Whenever you hear somebody say the Bible contradicts itself or it conflicts itself, they have not understood it. Actually, the Bible is so seamless. It, as in, there is no perfect book like the Bible. Even Shakespeare may contradict himself sometimes. But the Bible, very. Listen to this. You know, there are facts that are just so amazing. Prophecies written in the Old Testament. These were prophecies spread apart over what? Is it over five thousand years apart? You get what I mean? and over 300 of them are about Jesus. He comes in one lifetime and fulfills each of them. <laughs> That can't be a chance. That cannot be a chance. In one lifetime, 33 years, you fulfill something that was written 2000 years ago, 300 years ago, 400 years ago, 5000 and the ones who wrote them never met they were millenniums apart they were centuries apart as they spoke yet he came and fulfilled them he's on the cross and is my god my god why have you forsaken me written over 400 years before he was born by david says my god my god why have you forsaken me says they cast lots for my garment and they cast lots for his garment Moses over 2000 years he says no bone of the lamb should be broken during the passover and he's on the cross and they come to break their bones because as sabbath came they used to break their bones they come and he's already dead yet he was put on the cross last so if there was anyone to be found alive it was him 
but they find him dead. To fulfill what was written, no bone of the lamb should be broken. As in, it is just, it is just so amazing. Like a man comes and fulfills all these things. You know, the Bible doesn't contradict itself at all. So when he says, one baptism, he's talking about the greatest baptism. He's talking about the, because you see, he's talking about uh, one body. Let's go, let's go back there to Ephesians chapter 4, 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Let, go to, let's read from verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So, for many that may seem like a contradiction, but it is not a contradiction. He was talking of, because even here when he's saying, when he's talking about one Lord, he's talking about one Father, and many will still cling to that and say, no, no one can be my spiritual father or what, because he said, you know, that he's given us, he's given us this, and he says one God, and people who are anti-Trinity, this is where they go. He said one God. But you see, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Father are one God. Yeah, they are not different. They are one God. But the baptism he was talking about here is the most essential baptism. So you look at them, there are three. There are three baptisms. Yeah? There are three. And the most essential is the first one. We are dipped in the blood of Jesus Christ. We are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. We are dipped into his blood like a dye. And you see when that cloth, that fabric came out of that dye, it looked so different. It had a new look. It smelled different. It was a new fabric. It was a new fabric. Praise the Lord. I remember in high school, many people who are in art class, once in a while they would change their clothes and you would think they are new. But it's because they had the exposure to all the paints and colors, tie and dye, they would do everything. So you know, you just see hey, that guy has many polo t-shirts that are of different colors until it is it's the same. <laughs> as every week as I get new colors, I try to, to do something different. So that's why he says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. You are dipped into a new dye. You are put in a new dye. Now, this is a baptism that is done by the Holy Spirit. It is done by the Holy Spirit. And uh, it is what we would call baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, many people confuse baptism in the Holy Ghost and baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is the baptism everyone receives immediately they get born again. Immediately they receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They are baptized by the Holy Spirit. It is a baptism that the Holy Spirit does. Then he said, baptism of the Holy Spirit, the word of there, it is a word of possession. You get what I mean? Possession. In other words, it is a baptism that belongs. It is done by. Yeah. Like your work. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to do this. And when we get born again, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. It is a supernatural occurrence. Maybe we may not be able to explain it in detail, but he talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, and Galatians 3, 27. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit, you see it is spirit with capital S, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Are we all baptized into one body? He's talking about the body of Christ. By one spirit we are baptized into one body. The day you say, Lord Jesus, come into my life, be Lord of my life, you are baptized into the body of Christ. Yeah? Galatians 3.27 For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
So he's not talking about any other baptism. He's talking about baptism in the body of Christ. So from the day you get born again, you are supernaturally translated into the body of Christ. You are put in the family of Christ. It is a supernatural occurrence. It has nothing to do with you. You, 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 you don't participate in that baptism. All you do is being available. Praise the Lord. You don't hold your nose. You, you don't put on white clothes. You don't need co swimming costume. You know, you are just baptized. You, you, don't even, you may not even know it is happening. But you are baptized into his body. All of a sudden, you are into his body. There are angels in charge of you. These protect, they, as in things have just changed. You may sleep and your dreams are different that night. Praise the Lord. Things have changed. Something has just changed about you. That is why Christianity, I was just preaching to somebody just before we came here, and I was telling them the difference between Christianity and religion. Religion is man's quest for God. Christianity is God's quest for man. God comes to man. Yeah? That's deep. That one will sell. Hmm? Yeah? I know things. <laughs> najua, mimi najua. I've moved on, yeah. Perfection. Yeah, but yeah, so religion is that man trying to please God, man trying to get God's attention, man trying to, you know, to get an audience with God. That is religion. Christianity, God is coming after man. It is God coming after man. And when he comes after man, definitely he's going to reveal himself to man. You get what I mean? It is going to re he is going to reveal himself to man. And during this time, man will experience him. That is why you know, he says, he says that the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. In other words, when you get born again, you know it. You know it. Because God came after you. This is not religion anymore. Religion, you may not be sure. Religion, you wake up and say, have I read my Bible enough? I don't think I'm that holy. Uh, have, have I gone for Sunday services enough? Uh, am I clean enough? So many times when you're preaching to people who are in religion, they say, I don't feel like I'm ready. Uh, sitaki kudanganya mungu, eh, not today. Let, let me put my life in order. That is religion. They, they, they think it's their work. They think they, they can put things together, together until God accepts them, until they are ready. But now Christianity, God has come after man. God has come. He's come. He's not waited. And Romans chapter 5 verse 8 tells us, God commended his love toward us or demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, when we had not got our act together, Christ came and died for us. That is Christianity. And now the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit. You, I'm telling you, just know. Your friends look at you and they think you're foolish. Yeah. You get what I mean? You're walking on the road and you're smiling. And they're like, why are you smiling? And you know my sins are forgiven. You know, your talk changes. You're no longer saying, oh, we are all not righteous. We are all not holy. All that is in the past. All of a sudden, you're a new person. You just feel so holy. You just feel so good. Not because you've done anything, but because you've been baptized into the body of Christ. And the reality of it has happened. Now, this is the only baptism that is essential for salvation. This one is essential for salvation. The other two that we're going to talk about are not essential for salvation, but they are very important. The early church taught them as a requirement. Actually, you would not be counted as a disciple if you had not had all the three baptisms. But this is, and that is Christianity. People look at you and they're like, how do you believe? How do you believe a book that was written 2,000 years ago? These were just stories. These were human beings like us. People will tell you, ah, but we all serve the, the same God. And at that time, you may not even be deep in theology. You may not know how to explain to them. They may come with, the, with all arguments, but you're like, the man that was blind 
And we know that man is not a man of God. He uses a wrong spirit. He told them, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. And that is the experience that we have. You say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. And I know my sins are forgiven. My sins are forgiven. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You sing victory songs. You, you know it. You know when you sing like that man who sang in a deep voice. Moyoni. Eh? Moyoni. Nimempata Yesu. Moyoni. 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 And you see, to, to, to the outside person, you can't prove it. They're like, how do you know? How do you know there is even a soul? How do you know? You know, to, to them, it, it's just foolish. You, you just seem gullible. You just seem, but man, it is a reality. God has come to you. God has come to you. Heaven rejoices, and you rejoice. You sleep. You know, I've led people to Christ, and they tell me, Pastor, for the first time, I slept. The whole night, I slept. No fear. I feel peace. I'm like, yes, you are brought into the body. You are brought into, you've come to the company. Yeah? This company of numerable angels. You've come to Mount Zion. Yeah, it is different. Yeah, it is not numerable demons. It is angels. You've come to Mount Zion. That is why you could sleep. Something's changed. You had nothing to do with it. All you did was avail yourself and say, Yes, Lord, here I am. I accept you in my life. And something happened. Something you may not be able to articulate with English. Something you may not be able to. And that is why we preach the gospel. And we preach the gospel with the anointing of God. That we know that, you see, when I'm praying with somebody, that prayer, I know something is happening. I know this is not religion. It is different from, you see, when you're in religion, you're going to be told, ah, you go to church, be a good person. And you see, we, we believe that your morals will change, but we don't know if in your heart. So we, we have to keep encouraging you. We have to keep, but you know that if this person receives Jesus Christ, man, it is no longer about what you just, to, what you just told them. No, now. There is something greater. There is something that has happened in them. The spirit himself bears witness with their spirit. Any day they can boldly stand and say, I know I'm going to heaven. I know I'm on my way to heaven. I have a place in it. I'm not worried. They say, oh, none of us is sure. We don't know it is God who decides where you go and all that. Yes, but he decided it and he made a way. Praise the Lord. And we chose the way. We chose the way. Praise the Lord. He said, I present you life and death. Choose life. He cheated for us. We chose life. Hallelujah. We were wise to take the Mwakenya. You know, someone tells you there is life and death. So this is the Mwakenya. Choose life. We chose life. Yeah? Mwakesi. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mm. I know, I know my sins are forgiven. I know. That is... The baptism into the body of Christ. We are baptized in the body of Christ. Galatians 3.27. Oh, we've read Galatians 3.27. Yeah, we read. Yeah. yeah, then the second, number two, it is the baptism by Jesus. The baptism that Jesus does. Now that is baptism in the Holy Ghost. Now I've taught about that a lot. Yeah. The baptism that Jesus does. You see, the first one is a baptism done by the Holy Spirit. He baptizes us into Jesus. Now this one, it is Jesus baptizing us into the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus. Now Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. It is the baptism that Jesus does. The baptism Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And our men, Paul, say baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire is different 
We're going to talk about that Monday afternoon. Sunday, Sunday afternoon. But since we since we stopped the fast, I feel like it takes so long to meet. I feel like I feel like when did I, I, I sometimes I'm like, has so and so been coming? Then I realize actually they came on Sunday. Yeah, it is just that now we were used to meeting every day. So I'm like, has so and so been coming? I think we should start meeting daily. <laughs> yeah. He says that the one that comes will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John was baptizing them in water, in cold water. But he said, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah? Cold, dirty water. Yeah, cold, dirty water. That Jordan was dirty, you remember. Yeah. So that's why he was baptizing them. And he had camel skin. You know, because I've heard that the only thing that smells as worse than a, 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 than a camel is a wet camel skin. <laughs> yeah. John took things to another level. And imagine, he, and, and Jesus asked them, why did you go to sea in the wilderness? <laughs> how do you expect? You know that is how revival happens. You get what I mean? That's how revival happens. It comes in packages you don't expect. Yeah, this guy was here speaking. Legs of locusts falling out of his mouth. You know, as, you see, you complain about a, a, a preacher whose saliva hits you. Now imagine lo, locusts. Yeah? yeah? Yeah, but he was the revivalist that God had. Camel skin wet. <laughs> Huh? And he's baptizing you. And you know, if he's baptizing you, that means your head is going to get very close to the camel skin. You get what I mean? And he must speak close to your nose. And you see those legs and eyes and whatever, those parts of locusts. And Jesus told them, what did you expect? You expect to find a preacher with a good accent. You expect to find yeah, call a guy in your terms. Yeah. Yeah, in your terms. Which kind of pastor is that? Praise the Lord. Yeah. Many things were said about me, but I carried the power of God. Praise the Lord. Yeah. The people who didn't listen to me because I had a chain, the people who didn't listen to me because of different things. But that scripture encouraged mm. yeah, That scripture encourages me. Mm. Why did you go to see in the wilderness? Yeah. Because I remember. Yeah, especially after college. Even when I just came to Kenya, I still have my, my photos of my... Not, not even the, before the gold chain. I had the other one, the one that I'd made. Yeah. I said, like, are you not a witch doctor? Are those things not witchcraft? <laughs> I had my own African thing that I had made. And I said, that's the preacher. Mm, that's the preacher. Why did you go to see? And sometimes we are going to realize that Reasoning has substituted discernment. We go deeper, a little more. Will you be able to float again? <laughs> yeah. But there are many times we are going to miss the move of God because, because of what we were expecting. We, we become like the children of Israel. They made a golden calf that they worshipped. They, they, they made the God they had in their, in their mind. And they wanted to worship that God that they had in their mind. You get what I mean? So what is that God you have in your mind? What is that? Yeah. So people show up and like, hey, this church, people fall, people scream. And yeah, people laugh. Yeah, actually, there are people who don't come to church because people laugh. As in, they would, they would rather we are crying and gloomy and sad. And that would mean the presence of God is around. So the kingdom of God is joy. Yeah. yeah. The whole world does not want to be where people are gloomy. But now when we come, you see religion, when we come to church, we pretend that we want gloom. Yeah. We pretend that that's what we want. 
Hmm? We want laughter. So many times it's because we come with our preconceived ideas of religion and we may miss God because we think, oh, I didn't think he would prophesy that way. I didn't think that's the way. If he was really a man of God, this is how he would pray for me. If he was really a man of God, I remember there the, 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 the are people who sat and they, and you know how people can form committees very fast. And yet when their friends need money, they can't form such committees. But it's when they yeah. So people formed a committee and what they were talking about is how I blew on certain people and they fell. So they said, how does he blow on people? He, you know, like is that, I wish I had an opportunity to join their committee. I would ask them, how is it done? How should we be doing it? You theologians. How, how is it done? <laughs> you get what I mean? Mm. How is it done? Correct me. Teach me. Yeah. So many times, that's why when we come to God, we say, you crucify, you die to self. And when you die to self, you say, God, whichever way it's coming, if it is you, <laughs> that is what I want. And some of them are literally going to perplex us. The Jews missed him because they didn't think he would come from Bethlehem. They didn't think he could come from Nazareth. They're like, no. This guy, a carpenter, 30 years we've seen him do nothing. 30 years. One time I went to their home. It's me who had to clean up his poop from the floor. This is the one you say this is God. Yeah. He came like that. So even for John the Baptist, Jesus asked them, what did you go to see in the wilderness? You thought you were going to see a reed shaken? Hey, John the Baptist was not a reed shaken. He was not a soft preacher. He was not your kind of, oh, things will be okay. You show up and it's like, you sons of vipers, who warned you? <laughs> You know, you've come to, to confess. Because they had come, they had come to be baptized. They, in other words, today we would say they've come to get born again. <laughs> you vipers. Eh? Nini nyoka. Eh? Snake is nyoka. Yes, nini nyoka. Eh? You know, today, today's generation would... You know when the preacher said they would go for counseling? Yeah. They would, yeah. They would go for counseling, actually. They would say, actually, it's bad. Very traumatic. I have some trauma. Yeah, that, I'm telling you the truth. Yeah, today anything can cause you trauma. Anything, anything, anything. Yeah, yeah. A teacher saying that you failed your exam. You go for counseling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the teacher is going to be told how to tell you. Yeah, you can't say they failed. You, you say it this way. Yeah, you, you, you say, ah, you didn't hit the mark. You <laughs> Say something. In our times, in the 70s, we were told. <laughs> you guys were not there? <laughs> you guys were not there in the 70s. No wonder these things are shocking you. I'm there, you're wondering who doesn't go for counseling after you fail an exam? <laughs> For us, we didn't even know they were there. We, we, we didn't even know you can afford a counselor. <laughs> yeah. Because you failed, then you're caned at home again. <laughs> you, at school, you get below max. Then at home, you also get. Then you make sure that in some families, your, your mom does her part. Then she says, wait for your dad will continue. <laughs> when, <laughs> when he comes back. Yeah. And... And you're normal, you're just, a, you're just a normal child. Yeah, you're a normal child. You're very normal. Yeah, you're very normal. Actually, you don't think there is any abuse. You, you don't think they are doing anything they are not meant to do. Actually, if they did do it, you would be surprised. You would ask them, Mom, did you really see my report? <laughs> Why are you not doing what you're meant to do? <laughs> yeah, like, is it yesterday or the other day? Our daughter was telling us at night, we were telling her, don't take water at night, we don't want you to susu on bed. Don't take water. And she told us, I deserve water. <laughs> yeah. She told us, I deserve water. So you are like, hey, you deserve water. Who told you? Yes. <laughs> yeah. She told us, I deserve water. I'm like, hey. Hmm? You said, I deserve water. Now in the 70s, we would say, I deserve. I, de I deserve kiboko. Look at my, 
Look at my report, mom. Look at my report, dad. So imagine going to John's church. He's there in the water. You're like, ah, this preacher. He can't even brush his teeth. He's all the wings of locusts are still there. <laughs> now, I, I go on mentioning whatever was there on different days. Yeah, so I you know the first day on Monday it was legs. Then the other day it was eyes. So now we're on Wednesday. That's why I'm talking about wings. Hmm? Yes, W for wings. Yes. And he's there <laughs> in water. <laughs> Calling people, come be baptized. And they come, humble. You know they've humbled themselves. Come from their thrones to say, let's go, at least he may say good things about us. Because today when we see somebody come from the world and they get born again, we say good things about them. Imagine he was humble enough to come down and even be baptized. He didn't care that he's a celebrity. <laughs> that is not how John spoke. <laughs> you just said, you vipers. Who wants you of the coming judgment? Is it the coming? Eh? Then he said, unto, he said unto the multitude, come forth to be baptized. Oh, generation of vipers. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? <laughs> what a preaching. God anoint me to preach like that. Imagine. That is John. And Jesus tells them, who did you come? Who did you come to see? He baptized them in water. So this, the, the, the second baptism, it is done by Jesus. He baptizes us in, in the Holy Spirit. And Acts chapter 1, verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence and verse 8 he tells them but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you now the baptism in the Holy Spirit the baptism that Jesus uses does I mean it is a baptism of power it is a baptism to empower us it is not essential for salvation but it is essential to be effective as a Christian on earth very essential to be a Christian on earth. And to Jesus it was very important because these people were already believers. They had accepted him. We look at Thomas. Thomas confesses and he says, surely he calls him Lord. He confessed with his mouth so he had believed in his heart. And I believe that they had got born again because you see in, in John chapter 20, verse 20, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. No one could receive the Holy Spirit unless they were born again. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And I believe they received the Holy Spirit. They were baptized into the body. Yet he told them in Luke 24, tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power. He knew that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is going to come with power. There is a power that he wanted them to walk in. And there are a number of things that we see happening when the when the disciples are baptized when they are empowered uh, i have a full teaching just on that and this is these are some of the things that are also taught in discipleship that is why it's so important for you to go through the discipleship classes yeah but like i told you that it is only the first baptism that is essential for salvation but the early church didn't treat the other two lightly. Yeah? They were a requirement for believers. Actually, the early church had that order. You got born again, you were baptized in water. And after you were baptized in water, you had to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So sometimes we take, we take long even to baptize people in water, maybe because of our logistics and here. But it is so good that when people get born again, immediately they are baptized in water. Immediately. And that is why I say that when we go out there evangelizing, we preach and we find people who may not even be, who may not be, they may not be, they may be born again. You get what I mean? You preach to people and they tell you, I'm born again. I'm already, I'm already a believer. You should also ask them, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? You'll find that many believers, especially in our nation here, know nothing about that. Many. And it is a great opportunity for you to get them baptized 
in the Holy Spirit because it is empowering to them. Praise the Lord. Let's go. Let's read. Uh, let's read Acts chapter two. Let's read from verse one. Okay. Let's all let's all read. One, two, three. Let's go. sat upon each of them. Now you see when he said I'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now you see this is literally happening. The fire, the cloven tongues of fire that appeared upon them. Praise the Lord. So a lot that he's spoken about baptism of fire means suffering, means this. You know what I mean? That is not right. Baptism of fire is baptism in the Holy Spirit still. Let's go on. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And this is on the day of Pentecost. And Jesus had told them about this. John had actually told them about this. So I can imagine that during the time Jesus was on earth, because John had told them, I baptize you with water, but the one coming, because some of John's disciples left him and they, they joined Jesus. So I'm sure they remembered those words. So every day they were waiting. When is, he, when is he baptizing us in the Holy Spirit? How does that look? When is he baptizing us with the Holy Spirit and fire? And he finished. He died, resurrected, and they had not seen it. Then he tells them, wait until the promise of the Father comes. And they were baptized. And like he had told them, now many times, especially among Pentecostals and uh, charismatic circles, we say that evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit or baptism in the Holy Spirit is tongues. But you see, the Bible says you shall receive power. Hallelujah. Proof should be power. Because he told them, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall receive power. There are many believers who speak in tongues, but they are so powerless. Demons sometimes join them in speaking in tongues. So they wait for them. They sit beside them. Now I believe that speaking in tongues like we see in the Bible, many times it was the initial sign, the initial manifestation that somebody was filled with the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. But I've seen many people baptized in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, who didn't speak in tongues immediately. And sometimes it is because of mindsets. Every believer can speak in tongues and should speak in tongues. As long as you feel with the Holy Ghost. And this is true. I've proven this. Hallelujah. I don't know right now. I don't know in the last what, 10 years. I don't know anyone that I have prayed for who can come and say they didn't speak in tongues when I prayed for them. You know what I mean? So I can't say that. Oh, because it is God's gift that everyone I met, it was, the, the gift was for them. Because you people say, oh, it's just a gift. God gives it to some, and to some he does not. No. Do you mean that every person I'm meeting, they are the ones meant to meet? I'm never meeting anyone that is not meant to receive that gift. Or do you mean that everyone in this church is meant to receive that gift? Because whoever has been in this church at least for a month or three months, by that time you're speaking in tongues. So should we say that we only receive people who are meant to receive the gift? No. I've talked about tongues. It's also on YouTube. I've talked about the four tongues that are there. And you realize the gift and you realize this. The prayer language is not the gift he's talking about. It's not a, the prayer language is not among the nine gifts that he's talking about. The prayer language is different. He says, they that believe shall speak in tongues. That one he didn't say some of the believers. He said whoever believes. And... He says, he that prays in unknown tongue edifies himself. He speaks to God. He speaks mysteries. Paul comes to the church and says, I, I speak in tongues more than any of you. You know, that would be, if it was just a gift, that would be foolish to say that because some people are not meant to have that gift. You get what I mean? So when people are filled with the Holy Spirit, many times when people are taking long, at times it is because 
of mindsets, it's mind renewal. And that is why teaching of the word is so important. And you see, as people are taught the word and people are taught about this, it becomes very easy. It's just like everything. We teach about healing before we do healing many times. It, it increases the results that we see. Definitely, there are many times we just say, I want to pray for the sick. But you see, from teaching about healing, the numbers that we're going to see, the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The number is going to increase. Anything that we want to see in the body of Christ, we teach it and we will see results. We'll see the results as we teach it. Hallelujah. So on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And surely we can see that they were empowered because you see, Peter, the first thing that we see in Peter is boldness. Peter comes up and speaks before all these people who have gathered, calling them drunk. And why? Why did they call them drunk? Because there were manifestations. They were speaking like what? Hysterically. They were speaking like they were off. There was something that was, yeah, that seemed off. And when we are baptized in the Spirit, because He empowers us, many times that power will be experienced literally. Many times, you will see that this, as in there will just be a manifestation. There will just be a boldness that you did not have. You may shake under the power. It is real power. It touches your physical being. It is outward. When you get born again, you're baptized into the body of Christ. And when you get born again, you receive the Holy Spirit. But he is in your spirit. Now here he says, he shall come upon you, upon when you're baptized in him, it is upon. It is no longer just him in you. Now upon you. And that is just like when you are baptized in water. There will be water on you. When you're immersed in water, there will be water in, on you. So being baptized is different from drinking water. You get what I mean? So when you got born again, he says, is any of you thirsty? Let him come and drink. In other words, come and get born again. So you're thirsty. You're not born again. You come and drink. That is like a glass. That's like two glasses. And it will be in you. But he says, rivers of living water shall eventually flow out of you. Now that's when he comes upon you. From you he can impact. He can touch other people. You are empowered. There is an experience. There are many denominations, especially sensationists, and that are not, that they say, no, 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 no. This, there is no second experience. The only experience, there is one baptism. It is that there we get born again. It is that. It is one baptism. But you see clearly in the Bible, we see this as a second experience. We see it. It can happen immediately when you get born again. I know people have got born again and immediately they, they got filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. They saw visions. They prophesied. But I know majority, it has happened after. And we see examples in the Bible, like I'm showing you the example of the disciples. It happened to them. Later, they were in the upper room praying. They were, they were in the upper room waiting for these 10 days. And it happened to them. When we look at Acts 8, 14 to 17, Acts 8, 14 to 17, he says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. They had received Christ. They said they had received Christ already. Because this is, this is the account of Philip. Philip had gone to Samaria and he had preached. And the Bible says he preached Jesus to them. And many, they saw miracles, great things happen. And Philip came back to Jerusalem and gave a report of how many people in Samaria have received Christ. And they said, did they also receive the Holy Spirit? And now that is, Philip had not done that. So now they send Peter and John, not to get them born again, but for another experience, for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's read. We, for as yet he was fallen upon, mark the word upon, none of them, not in, upon, none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord, yeah, Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Now, when Simon saw that through laying on of hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money. Now, think about it. Simon, sorcerer, so not a believer. You get what I mean? So how did he see that they received the Holy Spirit? 
How do you see the Holy Spirit? I believe there must have been a manifestation. There is something he saw happen to them. So I believe he saw them speak in tongues, he saw them prophesy, he saw something happen. And you see, since he was a sorcerer, he was so interested in gimmicks, he was so interested in something that can put on a show. So he realized this guy is had a show so easily. They are maybe just laying hands on people and people are going down and like, wow, I need that, have some money. Because it's an investment capital. I believe I can make more money with this. You get what I mean? Because there is no way like, if he just saw them laid hands on, it would not have attracted him. It is what happened that must have attracted him to them. So they were believers, but they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. He had not yet fallen upon them. The Holy Spirit empowers us. And we, we all need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Then Acts chapter 9, verse 17 to 18. This is Paul. Yeah? And when Ananias went his way and entered into the house, putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Paul had already encountered Jesus on the way to Damascus. I believe he was already born again. But he sent Ananias to him that he might be filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Yeah, let's read 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Now, do you see these scales falling off? That's why I'm saying he empowers us for our day-to-day -day life to live. The Christian life is a supernatural life. God has called us to a supernatural life. It is not a life of just attending church and going home, being good. No. It is a supernatural life. And there is no way we are going to walk it as a supernatural life unless the Holy Spirit comes upon us. This changed my life. I was 14 years of age, but something's changed. I was 14 years of age, and the truth is that I'd got born again, but there are times I would doubt. There are times I would be like, wow, ah, the way I'm living. You know, because I was, I was really living. In a way that would make you wonder. I was a wonder. Praise the Lord. Hmm? And, but you see, as I was there kneeling high, but I knelt down. And as I was praying, I started shaking. My lips started shaking. I started speaking a language I had never spoken. So if that's all you're saying, if that's all you're saying, don't worry. Your pastor began that for a long time. So I was just ba -ba 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 -ba. So I'm like, what's that? I tried to stop. Ba -ba 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 -ba. So I'm like, am I speaking in tongues? Because I knew about tongues. My parents spoke in tongues. And I just, every day, you know, I'm like, ba -ba 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 -ba. and I'm telling you, I just felt like the most holy person on earth. I just feel like God is real. As in, he can touch me physically. All of a sudden, I know a language I've never spoken. You know how that doesn't make sense? I spoke in tongues and you're like, I'm speaking a language I've never been taught. Words I've never been, you know, I have not heard before. There is something it did to me as a Christian. I could pray longer than I had ever prayed. I would feel like, you know, like the more I prayed, ba 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 I would feel like there is something getting on me. I would feel like there is a change. It was literal. It was no longer something uh, that I, I just believed. And that is why Paul says to the Corinthians, when I came to you, I did not come in eloquence of speech. I did not want your faith to be established in human wisdom. That's why I came in demonstration of power and of the Spirit, that your faith should be in the power of God. Praise the Lord. Paul came with the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Paul had been baptized in the Holy Spirit. There is no way he would have come with the power of the Holy Spirit if he was not baptized in the Holy Spirit. There is no way God would tell Ananias to go and lay hands on Paul, on Saul, if Ananias had not received the Holy Spirit. He can only go because of that. And he says this, 
he says the spirit, the same the spirit that raised Christ from the dead shall vitalize our mortal bodies, shall quicken our mortal bodies. He gives life to our mortal bodies. And that is why at times you see as you lay hands on somebody, many of you have had testimonies of healing, and as the hand was laid on you, you literally felt the power of God go through where that illness was. And Maureen was testifying to us about, yeah, bronchitis. And she was telling us about her experience, what she felt. I don't remember the whole story. If you are not here on Sunday, go watch the video. But you see, she, she felt something. And when she raised her hands, she was free. It is real power. It can touch your body. Hallelujah. Yeah. And we see testimonies like that in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the Bible. We see in the New Testament, we see during the time of Jesus, as he spoke, the power was present. That there was power that was present as he spoke. As the disciples, as, as they came to arrest him, they said, we want to arrest him. And he says, he told them, I am he. And they fell back. That there were many times there were real manifestations of power. When possessed people came close to him, that there were manifestations there was power. The disciples, as they go out, Peter says, such as I have, I give unto you. Rise up and walk. Why? Why does Peter say such as I have? He knew he had received power because Jesus had told him in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Peter was not the kind who used to just go looking for lame people to pray for. <laughs> you get what I mean? We don't see that about him before that. But Jesus had told him, you shall receive power. And be witnesses unto me. Like I've told you, T.L. Osborne paraphrased that and said, You shall receive virtue, miracle working ability to produce proof of my resurrection with the necessary credentials. They had to produce proof that Jesus was alive. And people of that day had seen Jesus, they knew what Jesus could do. So if you were to tell them Jesus is alive, you should show them what he can do. Praise the Lord. Now, like, a lot of conspiracy that goes on. You see, we've been told what? We've been told Tupac never died. Is, haven't we been told Tupac never died? Yeah, Tupac is alive. But he's not producing any more songs. You see, that is, that is going to be the proof that Tupac is alive. You get what I mean? So these guys had a tough task to prove that Jesus is alive. We need to see the same works that he used to do. And he comes and says, such as I have, I give unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And 3,000 believed Jesus was alive. Because they, they knew Peter the fisherman. They knew he had never healed any lame man. And they heard him say, it is in the name of Jesus. Then that Jesus must be alive. And Peter told them, why marvel at us, although we did this by our own power. You know, as you guys know us. You get what I mean? It is just like, 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 like you know, like, uh, you know, you, you know when people now somebody today will be like, "Wow, you're powerful!" Oh, pastor, you you're this. But you know, this is somebody you went to high school with. You get it? He saw your grades in physics and what, and you're like, "Why, Marvel? You you surely know me, yeah? You know me. You remember me. You know. This is not by our own power. It is not by our own power that we did this. Hallelujah. But he had received." the baptism in the Holy Ghost and he was empowered and he did such things we see Paul from persecuting the church Paul Paul was good at he was killing people with violence, not power of the Holy Spirit but he was a Pharisee, studied so his ministry to convince anyone it had to end with it had to be solved by an argument. You get what I mean? With a discourse. It had to be exactly what he's telling the Corinthians. When I came to you, I did not come in eloquence of speech. Because this is what Paul had initially. He had eloquence of speech. A Pharisee of the Pharisees. Believed, it's believed Pharisees could memorize the Pentateuch. That is what Paul was. Saul was. So, but he's telling the Corinthians, that's not how I came. I encountered when Ananias laid hands on me, I received the Holy Spirit. I became a different minister. I didn't want your faith established in human wisdom. I've always said this. 
if you have if you have a good argument with somebody and set up a debate and convince them and they got born again because of your great what exegesis yeah somebody may come with a deeper argument and I've seen that a lot. I've seen many believers who come and say, I'm an atheist now. And I'm like, why? Some facts were laid out for them. You get what I mean? When the gospel came to them, they were established in human wisdom. They were established in historical. And I like these things. You know, I normally talk about these things just like we began us talking about these prophecies that have been fulfilled in Jesus. I like that. I say we are, we are going to begin uh, whatever for apologetics. I've always talked about that. They are very important. I want you as Christians, as children of God, as Ratsi to be very knowledgeable. But it is not enough. It is, it is not useless. It is not enough. It would be sad if we threw away the other one. It would be sad if we threw away what was so key to the apostles, what was so key to Jesus Christ, that he would tell them, tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power. The work that he has called us to do is a work that needs the power of God. You remember like that girl who was, the baby who was blind in East Pocot. You know, hearing the story of the family going back three months later, and showing that this baby, her eyes are still open and the family is still believing on Jesus. The dad was healed the same day and the dad is still healed. Doesn't that show you that this experience, there is something that it did to them that eloquence could never do. Human words could never do. Praise, especially as we go for these missions. Now you go to East Pocot. Go to East Pocot, you would realize that you know too much for them. And that is why we see that you, you, look, you look like at Africa, Asia, especially places where people were deep into some spiritism, occultism and whatever. It was very hard for some of the, for some of the sensationist denominations to penetrate those areas. You get what I mean? Those areas were penetrated with the gospel, with people who came in demonstration of power. We see, uh, I, I think it's even on YouTube, but Philippines. You see, right now, you know, there are many Christians in Philippines and all that. And they had, they had Christians, but there is a time there was this lady, what was her name? I think in the 19, was it 60s and what? And the video, there is a video on YouTube. But this lady was possessed and being tormented by demons and they were biting her they were literally she was put in a cell and they are biting her they are marks on her on her hands yeah and so they put her there there are guards there so they they surely know no one is coming into that prison no one is coming into that cell but they would find that she's still been beaten and demons would torment her and they brought a catholic priest they brought a catholic priest to pray for her and she cast him and he died. Was it in three days? They brought another person. Yeah. She cast like three people. They died. They would die. So now they go for Lester Samuel. By this time, Lester Samuel was not known. He was not known. He had gone there as a missionary. But you see, he's, he's struggling. You know, he's a missionary. He's struggling, you know, to get like to get like a what? A breakthrough in soul winning. He's in a new territory. He's in a yeah, she was called Clarita. Yeah, Clarita. So he's there. And they call him. And he hears these stories. Eh? The three people, that lady. Actually, it's the nurses that tell him, I think, that she cast. They die. So he decided to go and pray and fast. <laughs> he, yeah, he went, he went and prayed and fasted. Was it for three days? Then he said, I'll go back. Then he went back and he cast out that demon. And that lady was set free. And when that lady was set free, the governor of that city, was it governor or mayor? I don't remember, asked him, what do you want? 
and he said he wants that the was it the national stadium or but the stadium there and he said he wants it is it for six weeks free of charge to preach to people to win souls and that opened up that place up to today there is a church it's a, I think it's an assemblies of God church that time he was was he with assemblies of God or full gospel up to today one of the biggest churches there in Manila it's actually his grandson who is there pastoring and that lady they followed that testimony for many years she got married she had children and that story now that opened up an area now as a child of God as you grow to maturity I believe that because Paul in the same scripture where Paul is saying that that I didn't come in eloquence of speech but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should be established in the power of God and not in in human wisdom he goes on and I think it's in verse 6 where he says but when we are come to them that are mature we impart a higher wisdom yeah there is a higher wisdom that we impart in them that are mature in other words he's talking about when you get to a place I've explained this a lot especially when you're talking about job that as a child of God you come to a place where you don't need a miracle to believe you come to a place where Christ dwells in your heart by faith like he's praying for the Ephesians that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith but you see, you are empowered to give the world an experience because that experience that drew you in does not become irrelevant. And that is how you see that Paul would still be arrested and he's in prison and he writes to the, Corinth, to the uh, Philippians and he says, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. He's in prison and he's writing to Timothy and he's telling him, my life has come to an end. I've run the rest as in I've done well. Paul didn't need a prison break to believe that God is good. You get what I mean? But there is an unbeliever who is going to see the power of God hit that prison. And that is what is going to make them know about this God. And as they are established in doctrine, they come to a place where Christ dwells in their hearts by faith. It is no longer about what happened, that they really know him. They have a relationship with him that is beyond the manifestation. So the baptism in the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost coming upon you is for the world around you. When you get born again, the first baptism, being baptized into the body of Christ, is for you. The Holy Spirit in you is for you. He convicts you. He guides you. He helps you. Praise the Lord. We've been talking about uh, self-denial, sacrifice. It is only the Holy Spirit who makes such things make sense to us. You get what I mean? But when you're saying... God has called us to such a life. God has called us. Suffering is part of, the, of what he's called us to. Definitely the world does not understand that. They pretend that that is what they want. You get what I mean? Then when you experience it, they call you foolish. You get what I mean? You drive a good car, they will say, Ah, Jesus suffered and what? When you say, I'm leaving everything I'm doing, I'm going to his spoke out. To suffer. Are you foolish? Are you? I, I, I thought you were just telling me about when I, I tried to get good things, you told me Jesus has to suffer. Then when I go to suffer, he said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Jesus doesn't want that. Yeah? The world does not understand this. But now when you have the Holy Spirit in you, you get born. Everyone that gets born again, you immediately get the Holy Spirit in you. And he's the one who leads you into such things. He's the one who should... Why, why would the disciples come rejoicing that they were persecuted for Jesus' sake? No one would rejoice that they've been persecuted. Beaten, actually. It is only one who has a relationship with God, who has encountered the Holy Spirit, that knows that this is worth it. It is that one who has experienced that. But now the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost coming upon you, that is for the world around you. Praise the Lord. And this time when I, I started speaking in tongues, God filled with the Holy Ghost, I just knew that I could lay hands on people and things can happen. I believed it. And I started going after it. You get what I mean? Who is this? Who has this? Cut off people's casts on the leg. You get what I mean? You see how, you know, he empowers you. You, you, you sometimes you look, you, 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 you seem foolish to the world. But you see, you've been empowered and it is real. Spiritual man, revivals that have happened, all the moves of God that we talk about have had physical manifestations. Many books have edited them out. There's a revival that happened in China. I don't remember what time. But a move of God that was so big in China. 
And during that time, right now if you get many of the current contemporary books on that move of God, they've taken out things like Holy Ghost laughter, people crying, people being slain. They just talk about how many people came to the kingdom. We try to refine revival to a place that the world can accept it. We try to make it, but you see, we can just look at the first revival after Jesus was, after Jesus, the first move of God, after Jesus went to heaven. It wasn't what man would look at and say, this is proper. And some of the things in these moves, because of the manifestations, and you know, majority of us as human beings are carnal. Definitely things are going to go out of hand. And as we write, we are going to try to write only the good parts. Or what we think. But you see, at times as we are writing only the good parts, what we think is not good may just be something that we had not understood yet. It is just like right now, how there is a debate, you know, many, especially now because of uh, understanding new creation realities, the grace of God. People try to reason that it is not God who killed Herod. It's in the New Testament. He stood up and spoke and the people applauded and they said, wow, he speaks like God. His voice is like... They say, an angel smote him. Now we would really like to write that out of our books because God is a loving God. How does he kill someone? So we want to write it out. Instead of saying, God, help me understand some of these things. So we're going to eliminate that. So many times when the moves of God have happened, many of these things have been eliminated. I remember, like one of the uh, most recent guys was the, we talk about the Jesus movement. And one of the people that was very keen that Jesus movement is left out in many of the stories that you hear. It was Lonnie Frisbee. You can go and look at Lonnie Frisbee. Yeah. Many will just see it is attributed to Chuck Smith and... Uh, many of the people, because the Jesus movement, many hippies were coming out, Calvary, Calvary Temple, Calvary Chapel was great at the center. But Lonnie Frisbee was like the great catalyst. But Lonnie Frisbee's life was not a life you want to talk about. He came from a, a bad life, heroin, acid, what he was, all the hippies like they were, shooting drugs and all that gay relationship and he came and when he came to Chuck's church because he was a young hippie he was soul winning like crazy the power of God fell upon him and he was just with a couple he got born again a couple led him to Christ and this couple would stand on the street and try to win people to Christ and you see the whole day maybe two people would listen to them Lonnie Frisbee went out with them and in one day a crowd gathered around Lonnie Frisbee led guys to Christ and the couple told him, you're an evangelist. He didn't even know what, what that was. You know, he, he, he was, but he went on like that and he saw the power of God. Many hippies were chained. Uh, one testifies, and you know, many of them are still alive up to now. They saw, they, they saw that Jesus movement. Greg Glory. Many of you have seen Greg Glory. You know, Greg Glory does crucifix. Greg Glory was like a spiritual son to Chatham. Greg Glory was a, he, he was a high school student, a hippie very against Christians. And Lonnie Frisbee comes to preach in school and he started cursing him. So because Lonnie Frisbee at l lunch break is preaching to people with uh, small crowds, so students, he would come, then he stands on one of the desks in the compound and he speaks to them. So Greg Glory comes and starts cursing him, he starts speaking, is this hippie? And Lonnie Frisbee pointed at Greg Glory and Greg Glory was hit by the power of God and pinned on the ground until Lonnie Frisbee finished preaching to these people. Then Lonnie Frisbee went to him, and Greg Glory was freed from the ground. Lonnie Frisbee led him to Christ. That's how Greg Glory got born again. And great things happened during, during that time. But gradually, Lonnie Frisbee started going back to his old life. So he would be in club on Saturday, then on Sunday he would be preaching powerful in church. He traveled all over the world because he carried the anointing. But he didn't have character, especially in the later years. He got into some other gay relationships still. And that's how he contacted HIV. He actually died of HIV. So it's embarrassing on us as the body of Christ to include that in our story. 
but it's a very important part of the story. And you see, when we look at some of these stories, they don't make us feel like, they're not stories that make us feel like, wow, God condones sin. But these are stories that make us feel like we have no excuse. Yeah. If God could do it through such an imperfect man, I can't talk about my imperfections. Praise the Lord. Yeah. yeah you can read, there is there's a biography, there is a book. I had the book. Lonnie Frisbee, my wife bought for me as a gift for... I used to talk about him a lot. I really loved him. My wife bought for me. Before we were even married, she surprised me. It was a birthday. I don't know, yeah, but she ordered for a book for me from the States. You can look for, for that book. But what was happening here? He received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I said, the baptism in the Holy Spirit will bring real physical manifestations. Physical manifestations are part of the Christian work. It is a supernatural life. Sensationists have tried to put it off, to write it. Now, just think about us as a ministry. Would we even be here? As in it is supernatural occurrences. The people we've seen healed here, the testimonies, the people we've seen stay here. How many people have been healed here by the power of God? This has changed our lives. This is what is giving us a... a this is a lot of the confidence and the results that we are seeing in East Pokot. It's because of this. Many people have gone to East Pokot. But you see, when we go and we are like, we are seeing many blind people. Some of them can't be treated anymore. Maybe it would require very expensive operations. They don't have money for, no NGO is offering that. But when we go and lay hands on them, that is their introduction to this Jesus. Hallelujah. That is an introduction to this Jesus. I see many testimonies up to today of people that were touched by the power of God right from the early days. And up to today, they are, they are, they are, there is one time we, were, we had gone back to Uganda. There is a lady we met on the road, and she was, I could not even remember her, but I, I think I had just finished high school, so I went to preach in their church. So she's still a believer. Yeah, we met her with my wife. I think right now, she, I don't know, she's in Qatar, Dubai, she's somewhere in the Middle East. So he met her and she's like, yeah. Like how she just told us, you laid hands on me. I started speaking in tongues. I didn't know that I could ever speak in tongues. As in she said, that is what changed her Christianity. She stand. I didn't even know her. Just a high school kid doing ministry. And you see many stories like that. And I'm so glad that I was introduced to the power of God. Praise the Lord. Because it made a difference in my life. I got to realize that, wow. Even if the person who led me to Christ came right now and told me, my friend, it was a lie. Whatever he told you was not true. I will tell him you're too late. I've experienced it for myself. Praise the Lord. And so that is why it is very good for when people get born again. We introduce them to this very early. They will make mistakes, but at least they grow knowing. Many believers who come to Christ, and we don't experience ex we don't expose them to the supernatural working of God so early, they become religious called Christians. They become that. Their new birth experience was real. But you see, the growth now becomes a growth of human wisdom. A lot of, it, it, it becomes that. But you see, when somebody, now the problem is that when people experience the, the the supernatural, and then they are not established in the foundational doctrines, that can also become very explosive. People can go into all kinds of things. They are not grounded. The word grounds us. The word puts us in, it puts us in check. But the, the, the power of God should not be substituted by the word or the word of God. God purpose that it all works together. We look at Jesus. Jesus is perfect theology. Look at his life. Look at his ministry. It pleased him that the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelt in him. Then in Hebrews he tells us that he's the express image of the invisible God. So we look to Jesus healing the sick, raising the dead, was not a trivial ministry. It was not a trivial ministry. Otherwise he would not have done it as much as he did it. But he did it to fulfill scripture. He did it. And then when he's telling the disciples, he tells them, tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power. 
I know you've learned from me. You've seen how I preach. You've seen how I speak. But that is not enough. You need the promise of the Father. And we see a difference in the disciples. Peter was a timid guy. Peter denied Jesus when Jesus was a few meters away from him. He said, I don't know him. And as if to test if he was not just sure of what he was saying, he's asked another time. He says, I've never seen him. And he's asked the third time. And he's like, Nani Nube Baje? Mimi. Look at me. I'm actually wondering what's happening here. <sighs> and yet on the day of Pentecost, Peter comes out and speaks about this very Jesus when Jesus was not there physically. He comes out and tells these people. Peter tells them how they crucified him. Peter speaks until they are cut to the hearts. As in, where did this boldness come from? You could not identify with him when he was alive. And now you're ready to even be arrested because of him. He's put in prison and he's told when they are being released with John. Actually, it's twice. You know, at first when they were arrested, they are released and they are told, do not preach in this name anymore, the name of Jesus. Peter tells them, tell us, should we obey you or God? And you see, it's just at the gate of the prison, they are releasing him so they can easily kick you back or just do this and you stumble back and they shut the door. As in, he's not scared. And in the next chapter, I think seven or six, or still six, he says it again. They find that now, this time they, they, they took them in prison, then they, the angel released them and all that, and they said they're in the synagogues and what, and then they brought in, them in. He still asked them, is it you we should obey? And he told them, in, in chapter four, he told them, there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. It is that name, the one that was rejected, the stone that was rejected. Why is Peter so bold to speak about such a Jesus who is not here physically? It is because Peter had been empowered to be a witness. It was no longer a story. Jesus was a reality to him. This boldness. And he comes to this man and says, silver and gold I do not have, but such as I have I give unto you. Rise up. Praise the Lord. They were different. They were different. And no wonder in Antioch they called them Christians. Because they were doing things like Christ. They called them Christians. It was not a cool thing. They're not calling them Christians as a good thing. So I don't think it was much about the moral. I don't think it was so much about their moral modification aligned to the one of Christ. I think it was a lot about the manifestations. Because that is what they were persecuted for most. It was not mainly the character. It was the manifestation. So if they are calling them Christians and not as a good thing, it was because of these things that they did not want. And I know today we've been told how you live is very important. It is very important. But sometimes you see when we say this, we speak such things as if the other is not important. But you see, that is humanity. Humanity has been taught to only have one option. You either have this or that. But Jesus always introduces us to multiple. Jesus always shows us that you can have both. You can have power and have character. You can be anointed and have... You don't need to choose one. But you see, when I come and preach about character, I'll preach about character as if anointing is not good. There is a place for character. There is a place for anointing. And the power of God is very necessary if we are going to reach our world. See, right now we've been talking about evangelism. We are, on Sunday we are talking about soul winning, going out to the lost. Some and other the church has lost. And you see, that's why normally it says we are here debating among ourselves, growing among ourselves, saying who is most prophetic, running from conference to conference, seminar to seminar. The world is perishing. The world needs Jesus. Praise the Lord. The world needs Jesus. So when you realize the need that is out there, you may realize that we don't have a lot of time to gauge ourselves who is more spiritual and who is not more spiritual. That is what the disciples were on that. A lot. You know, they are being persecuted from city to city, but they know we have one mandate, a great commission. I told you they used to greet themselves. He's returning soon. Then we say, praise the Lord, brother. 
Bwana asifiwe. This was his returning soon and that gave them urgency. We must do the work before he comes. They were so convinced about his return. Hallelujah. Baptism in the Holy Spirit very important. Otherwise you're going to live a powerless life as a Christian. And I'm sure if I called out testimonies many of you can testify about that that from that time the power of the Holy Ghost fell upon you. Your Christianity changed. You know, you're like I was a Christian, my parents took me to church, I was baptized or but you are there but that day the power of the Holy Ghost came upon you. Your life changed. Now you can quench it. He talks about not quenching the Holy Spirit. Quenching him is different from grieving him, but quenching is like to to put off the fire. To pour water on. That is quenching. Like quenching your thirst. <laughs> Sprite can't do that. Only water can. Hallelujah. Yeah, even quencher can't. <laughs> Actually, quencher is worse. But <laughs> so it is not guaranteed that just because you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, you're going to live a life of power. Definitely it is the beginning. But don't quench the Holy Ghost. Uh, some of the things, you know, I've told you about my experience of how I had to choose this because a time came where this seems to be embarrassing, especially in Porto. Why should people fall in your church? Why do you pray like that? Why do you pray loudly? Why should you cry? And you know, like, I think we can be proper. I think people would like what is happening right now. People are not crying. People are not falling. But you say, I remembered. That is how God touched my life. And it was very precious to me. At that time, I did not despise it. So now I think I have grown. I've gathered some 50 people. So I can now change and do things my way. Hmm? Pesa kidogo kidogo. Umeacha vitu za Holy Ghost. You know, eh? You know, like it's very easy. And I know many Christians who have grown as we grow. I remember uh, Dr. Michael Brown talking about this. You can read about Dr. Michael Brown. In his, doing, in his studying theology, especially when he was doing his PhD, he really wanted, because he was charismatic, he spoke in tongues, he did all this. So he really wanted to, to put an end to that. Because imagine most of his colleagues, you know, professors, you know, people call themselves professor even before they are professor. And as long as you're doing PhD and you finish, people will call you professor or doctor or whatever. So to many of them, it was not cool the things that Dr. Michael Brown was involved in. So it started getting to him and he wanted to get to a point where he could disprove fellow Pentecostals and charismatic. So he started looking for every book, every research that would help him to properly show that these manifestations are not meant to be for today. And he says, the more he got into them, the more he got into the world, the more he realized there is no way, there is actually no way of taking them away. And he was, he was there, he was in the Brownsville Revival, in the meeting, and yeah, so it's like there are things that feel embarrassing. People look at you, and when they see this manifestation, they think you're not a scholar. Are you sure? Are you a lawyer? You're just there with people screaming and doing what? Ah, you, you, you know, they think these things are for the unlearned. But you know, that is why you have to be humble as a child. You have to be, you, you have to humble yourself. Because there are things that God is going to do and they're not going to be on your terms. They are on his terms. And it really takes humility to receive what God has for us. For you to go on and experience him fully. And I'm sure that is why Paul was humbled in such a way. Paul could not understand what these guys are going on propagating. Are you reasoning? God can heal HIV? You, Christians sometimes don't reason. You know, you, you just, how do you say God can heal HIV? Yeah, such things have been said. I told you one time, my friend saw a picture and I prayed for somebody who had had a cast. You get what I mean? And we took off, they had got fractured. So you saw the picture was online. Picture from that meeting. He's in Britain. He's in the British Army. He, we were with him in high school. He was my best friend. So he's like, he, he sent me the picture. He's like, do you really believe that miracles happen? So I told him, yes. So he's like, okay. Uh, I'm not at that level. I'm a Christian, but 
in other words, there are things I'm getting into that are, you, you get what I mean? You are telling me there are things I'm getting into that are, are too much. It's, I, I'm acting like I'm unlearned. I'm acting like I'm... You get what I mean? But I realize that that's a very small price to pay. I realize that I choose God. He says, if they did those things to him, he said, we will do them, they will do them to us. He said, the student is not greater than the teacher. So I being your master, him being, he was persecuted. He was told he has the spirit of Beelzebub. He was told all these things. So he was telling the disciples, even you, this is going to happen to you. You can't avoid this. It is going to happen to you. And when you receive the, when, when these things start getting to you, it becomes very easy to quench the Holy Spirit, to quench the fire. Because, and, and for, when I got filled with the Holy Ghost at 14, I spoke in the, my tongues didn't change the what, the vocabulary, the, I would just, bah, 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 bah. from 14 years of age to 17 years of age. But why? I think was, I quenched him because I got filled with the Holy Spirit, but I was not in groups where it's okay to speak in tongues. We all just go to fellowship and we whisper. Then we had one of the Bible studies we had. People were debating how tongues were not for today. There was a debate. High school. Some people came with scripture and some of these, some of these are the top, the S students in school who are in fellowship. You know, the ones who are respected as the proper, coming from proper families, bread, and they open and they say, no, no. Paul said, actually, if one is speaking, there must be one to interpret. So, you know, you want to be cool like these students. So, we just speak in tongues in hiding. You know what I mean? Like that. Then, even at home, home church, it was not a big deal. My parents spoke in tongues, but in church, you know, it was not an explosive thing. Like, we were not just getting into manifestations as much. Then, at 17, I joined another school. Now I get to this fellowship, I've told you this, get to the fellowship, this is a school where we are with Pastor Tim, Pastor Eric Wandeba. So, I'm, so first of all, I've got to this school, but I don't want to go because I just knew that anywhere I go, I'll be called to be a leader. Somehow, I just knew it. I just knew that God had called me for more than just sitting. And I knew that, I, I just knew that from 14 when I was filled with the Holy Ghost, that I can never escape serving God. Like, I just knew that in case, mine is just to show up. Immediately I show up, I'll be identified. You, God has called you. I just knew that. Anyway, even when I was stubborn during that time, telling you I'm smoking, I'm drinking, I'm doing what, in case I got into a particular circle, people would just ask me, so tell us about the scripture. So, you know, like that, it would just be just somehow. And I would also, my passion was there. Like, I would really soul win. You get know what I mean? Like, I would really tell people about Jesus Christ. At, 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 at 14, 15, I came to Eldoret. I've told you that story. Came to Eldoret and was there busy, winning souls, preaching to people. Try, we, we were in an interdenomination world, so they don't really go for miracles. And, but I was there praying. I'm looking for the sick. I'm praying for them. And I'm just a 14, 15 year old. So now at 17, I go to this school. So I keep away from fellowship for a while. Because I'm like, what if they get me? And then I knew that there is somebody in that school who we had been with in the former school. So, you know, I'm just feeling he's just going to be like, that guy, no, that guy is pretending he can't be a Christian. Because he knows my life. And you see, that was always, I, I always feared people to judge me. So now I enter fellowship and I'm entering at the back. The guy is preaching here. What? An 18 year old student, a form six guy. So he's here preaching. And he's like, gentleman, you who has just entered. I know you did not want to come to this school. You wanted to go to another school. And you know, he just starts prophesying. He says, but God has called you and you're going to serve God. And he blew. And I fell right there in the door. You know, my legs just became a... So, this is the school I'm joining in Form 5. As in the manifestations are just there. So as the service goes on, later they help me up. I come sit. Then now time comes for praying. Lays hands on me. Everyone is as in the power of God is tangible in that place. A hand is laid on me. You know, it's like a lightning bolt has just gone through me. My tongues changed immediately. Immediately. I stopped. You get what I mean? Yeah. And they changed. So I feel like all that time there was not great improvement in me experiencing the supernatural 
because I was in an environment that made me quench, that made me quench. And so don't get embarrassed about the manifestation, things that are going on in your life. There are things, I thank God that now later I met my spiritual father, Bishop Isaiah, and he really encouraged me. I think he would see. And because you see, some of the things that were happening in my life, I would be embarrassed. What are people going to think? I told you my legs shook for three months. <laughs> three months, I could not stand straight like this. Three months, yeah. But Bishop Isaiah spoke to me and told me, to whom much is given, much is required. He told me some of these things that are happening to you, you'll be making others have them. <laughs> I wonder how he spoke just direct to the childlike person he was speaking to. I think that was exciting to me as a person. Maybe it was not a, a proper thing to say, I don't know. But he just told me that these things, like, there is a lot that is being deposited in you. So many times I would come, the power of God touches me. I don't even know for what. Because you see, initially I would be reasoning. I'm like, but God now, so why am I crying? Why am I shaking? You get it? I, wa I want it at least if the preacher came and said, God is anointing you for healing. So at least I know why I'm shaking. The healing power is getting into me. But sometimes I'm just seated here, the preacher is preaching, I just start crying. So I'm like, God, now, why? Why? Because as a human being, you always want to be in charge. You want to be in control. You don't want anything that makes you feel like I'm not in charge. But you see, as long as we are going to serve him in power, we are going to lose that control. Yeah. He's not going to override our free will, but we are going to surrender. We are going to surrender to him. We are going to say, your way. Not my way, but your way. Yeah. And he will. And that is what happened to the disciples. Yeah. I don't think they felt it was fun to be called drunkards. Yeah. These guys are drunk, especially in the morning. Yeah. Even if you're drunk in the morning, you don't want anyone to call you a dream. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Have you been there? Shout aloud, yes. Have you been there? Ah, yeah. Still, you can't surrender? <laughs> Now the last, we'll talk about the last one. The last one is water baptism, or the believer's baptism. This only happens after we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And like I've said, these two baptisms uh, in the Holy Spirit and water, they are not essential for salvation, but they are very important for us as children of God. Uh, the first one, being baptized in the body of Christ, that one is essential, very essential for us, done by the Holy Spirit. So water baptism, just like being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and what, all that is not a requirement for you to go to heaven. It's not a requirement for you to, to have a relationship with Jesus. But you can see the importance of them. And like I told you, to the early church, these were very crucial. You see how these people get, these people get born again and they send John and Peter to go there. As in that's how important it was. John and Peter were senior apostles. Today John and Peter would have been called Bingo or Mabingwa, Archbishop, eh? Emeritus. They, they would have been called something. <laughs> Hallelujah. But they send them because it is so important. You remember even Paul, we didn't read that, but you remember Paul goes to Ephesus and he meets these disciples of John. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? They said, no. We've not even heard that there be any Holy Ghost. Just like, then unto what were you baptized when you, you know, as in to them it was so crucial. It was a very major thing. Like, they, they, they really felt pity for you, compassion for you, if you were not baptized in the Holy Ghost. Because they felt like you're going to live a weak life. You're going to live a, a life of no supernatural courage. And in this world, life is spiritual. You can't really. imagine every sickness that comes your way. You just run to the dawa, to the chemist or whatever. Every issue that comes, you run to human solutions. You can't believe that was a Christian. You're given an upper hand. You've been empowered. Every person you're preaching to, you had Pastor Okema gave a testimony of how his entire family got born again. He got born again. Got filled with the Holy Ghost. He's in high school. And he goes home, his dad was, his dad used to consult with witch doctors, he was a polygamous man, learned man, okay family, they were not uh, poor, not, but you know they were bound because of witchcraft, because the dad kept going. With a lot of property and what the sisters educated, one of the sisters is, she's a doctor, like they are good, like a good family, a family that would be uh, admired, you get what I mean? 
But, so he comes home as this high school student, preaching to these people, you know, these people are not believing. And then, one of those, he starts praying in the house. The sister, demons manifest. And he cast demons out of one by one. And the entire family gets born again. Now, you need such supernatural occurrences sometimes. Sometimes to see people get born again, we are going to see the power of God. Praise the Lord. Now, all of us as believers are going to need such occurrences at one time. Let me tell you, every believer, at one time, you secretly desire that John, what, 16, 16, 17 happens in your life. There's a time you're like, this sign shall follow them that believe. As in, you may be against miracles, but there is that day your sister is going to be on that deathbed. Your dad is going to be sad. As in, there is that day you're like, God, can you, you, there is that day you're going to pray for a miracle. And what does that show you? Inherently, God created you for them. God created you to live a supernatural life. There is that day. You're going to be fired at work and you're like, God, I've had you perform miracles. I don't know how that reports. I... Like, I can't do it, but God, if you can do a miracle, if you just make the boss not come, you know, there, you'll start believing in miracles. Yeah? Inherently, God has created us for that. If you are a Christian and you have no longing for miracle at all, you're dying. So water baptism, this only happens after we receive Jesus Christ. That is why we don't baptize infants in this church. Because they've not yet come to that place to make a decision. They've not come to a place where they, they... We will baptize children, but not infants. Children who have made the decision and received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And many times this can be at different ages. You get what I mean? It can be at different ages, different children. A child can get born again as early as four, three, and they are really born again. They've really believed. Like I've told you, you've seen children speak in tongues. I've laid hands on children four years of age, filled with the Holy Ghost and start speaking in tongues took a different life. Yeah. Uh, it is an outward act or proclamation of burying the dead man. When you got born again, the, dead man, the, the old man died. When you baptize in water, imagine Paul dedicates almost a, a, a chapter to this, to water baptism. That's how important it was for them. Yeah. Romans chapter 6. He's speaking about that. And it is one of the it is one of the outward things that we do that propel our lives into a direction of obedience. Because it is one of the first acts of obedience when we get born again. Because Jesus talked about us being baptized. So we are outwardly obeying. I listened to this testimony, a preacher was saying there's a preacher they were helping, and this preacher, he had many struggles of character in his life. He's a preacher, but there are many things he's struggling with and like he can't just obey God like he's sinning here he's doing this and the preacher asked them when were you water baptized like I wasn't baptized it's, it, it's not necessary for salvation and to him he's like he felt God tell him that's the problem he's been disobedient from the beginning so it's true he's going to go to heaven and what but he like it's a great opportunity for us to obey God and we are public it is just like I normally say that you saying Jesus be Lord of my life confessing with your mouth is not necessarily what makes you born again he says for with the heart man believes unto righteousness with your heart you believe unto righteousness actually the confession prayer that we pray is not older than 700 years when people started even even as you know you we were even hearing some of the history even just here in Kenya in the 1950s there are not many like altar calls like confess people presented Jesus to you and they told you if you call on his name you'll be born again so people called on his name as they went home they went their bed and they made a I don't mean that the sinner's prayer is useless it helps us it helps us to help people's faith and to make that they're sure and you see we make altar calls here yeah, and I, I do that every Sunday I'm doing the we go through the confession, we, we, make the, we go through the sinner's prayer, but it is not what makes you. The sinner's prayer is you outwardly declaring this that you've already believed in your heart. 
by the time you step and come in front here you've already believed so think about it if somebody just walked and came here to get born again and this building was bombed are they born again or not you get what i mean yeah it is with the heart that man believes it is with the heart that you believe unto righteousness you receive righteousness and that is how even people there are people who can't speak there are people you 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 now preach to people on their deathbed and i know they can hear me but they can't speak and i've spoken to them and i've told them you can agree with me you get what i mean they believed they could not confess they could not speak it with their mouth but they believed and i'm sure they're in heaven hallelujah so baptism also is an outward expression of what has happened and we've seen supernatural things happen here in church as we've baptized people we've seen people healed when we baptize ivy is here ivy got healed of ulcers i hope you're still healed yeah and how many years are those when was ivy baptized which year was that 2018 2018 she came out of the water and her ulcers healed told she could never eat pineapples she got out of that water and she ate a pineapple that very day and she is still healed up to today so it is not just a certain ritual we've had people have got in the water and got out of the water speaking in tongues i've always given you this testimony of owen he's not here today but he was the i think cause of where he's coming from he was against this they didn't believe in speaking in tongues actually the group they had come with many of them uh, they left they thought we are weird we are so but he signed up and came for baptism he had we were going to baptize <laughs> You know what I mean? He didn't like our tongues, he didn't like but he liked our baptism. So he came. <laughs> so I was the one baptizing. So put him in water, he got out of the water. So <laughs> so me I thought he was shivering. Then you see here, I'm getting closer, he's actually speaking in tongues. So I asked him, "When did you start just to get out of the water?" <laughs> So it is not just you know I know people who have had tattoos they did not want maybe evil tattoos they had put and they got out of the water and that tattoo was not there anymore that tattoo was washed away scars it is supernatural god endorses it and the baptism that we do is not the baptism of John because many people will say we are baptized to fulfill all righteousness no that was the baptism of John and Jesus did it to fulfill all righteousness because Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness for us He came to accomplish the law which we could not accomplish in our flesh. So it is Jesus who has to fulfill all righteousness. We are not fulfilling all righteousness when we are baptized. The baptism of John was a baptism unto repentance. It was a baptism of people who are not born again. That one was made obsolete. It is we no longer have the baptism of John. It's true he baptized in water but his baptism was not the baptism that we do today. This is a different baptism. So it is also called the believers baptism because this is a baptism now we've talked about the first one is the holy spirit who does it so it's the baptism of the holy spirit he baptizes you into the body of christ the second one is the baptism of jesus jesus baptizes you in the holy spirit because john said the one who comes shall baptize it is jesus who baptizes us in the holy spirit and that is why you see that you don't necessarily need a hand laid on you to be baptized in the holy spirit like i've told you my experience no hand was laid on me If hands can be laid on us like we have seen in the scripture guys that hands were laid on but we also see people that hands were not laid on like on the day of pentecost you you can just say father I've understood this today this was taught and I've understood I need I need them powering of the holy ghost fill me with your holy spirit and I believe I'll have the manifestations and as you worship him you burst out in tongues just alone in your house very Uh, yeah so now baptism in water baptism in water it is a baptism done by believers and as we go on as a church our demographics right now are a bit young but we really want fathers to always baptize their children that fathers will be baptizing their children. it's not a, it's, it's not that a pastor should because you see we believe fathers should have responsibility to bring up their children in the ways of the lord so every stage in our spiritual walk which seems to be a ceremony in our spiritual walk it would be very good if fathers do it hallelujah so 
you, any of you, if you are a believer, you've been baptized, you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can baptize. Yeah, it is not a pastor, it is not, you can baptize. And, and, and we see that in the New Testament, it was very crucial in the early church. These people baptized, they baptized people, somebody got born again and they were baptized immediately. In Bungoma, we were meant to baptize people, but I don't remember why we, we didn't baptize people. But I pray that in Kisumu we baptize people. Yeah, we are meant to baptize people. And it is so important. People get born again and we baptize them. It is not an experience. I remember when I was being baptized, it is my dad who baptized me. And you know, he was asking me questions like, Benja, do you really believe in Jesus? Do you believe that he died and rose again? Do you believe that as you are, you, 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 you're taken in this water, you acknowledge that the old man died? It was a very serious moment for me. I looked up to see if the heavens were opening, but I was humble. I had to look down and I had to look down and concentrate. <laughs> but it was a very as a 14 year old, I was like, what? as in it just became a serious something happened, I can't explain. But it just became a supernatural thing. It just became a very spiritual event. And I went in that water, I came out of that water. They were praying for people to speak in tongues. They prayed for us. I didn't speak in tongues that day. But I just felt like there was something that happened to me. Hallelujah. So it is a very important experience. So we'll look at some of the experiences in, uh, uh, in Acts. Uh, we'll look at a few. I'll just be reading very quickly. Acts 8, 12. You can write them down, then we'll read them. Acts 8, 12. Acts 8, 15. 8, 36. 9, 18. 10, 47. 16, 15. 16, As we read them, maybe you can write if you didn't get all of them. Yeah? But the good thing is that the very first three are in 8. So, 8.12. Let's start with 8.12. Then we go to 8.15. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Verse 15. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy, the Holy Spirit. These are the people that are after the, you know, Philip had baptized them, then now Paul, Peter and John were sent to them. You see, that's the order that they were using. 36 and 38. 36, that's 8, 36 and 38. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me? To be baptized. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, and both Philip and the eunuch. Both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And you know, you can imagine how this also shows you, doesn't this show you that maybe he had not said a certain confession prayer? But the preaching that Philip had presented was enough for this man to understand that water baptism is relevant. That they reach water and he asks him, why don't I be baptized? And Philip is like, if you believe, if you are really born again. So it means maybe they had not said a certain prayer. And he said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he goes in the water and baptizes him. Uh, chapter 9 verse 18 and immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forthright and arose and was baptized that is Paul yeah. then 1047 this is Cornelius account can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we you see how it was so crucial to them immediately, same day, they baptized these people. 
16, 15. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us saying, if ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. You see? And 16.33 And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their streets and was baptized. He and all, all his straight away. Straight away. At night, they didn't wait even for morning. This is how essential it was to them. They, these things were not taken lightly. You get what I mean? Then, uh, 19.5 when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. These are the disciples in uh, Ephesus, those that Paul was praying for. So all these scriptures, as you read them, you read them uh, these are three different baptisms. I've talked about them in this short time. Definitely we have teachings on them. Uh, the, topic is, the topic is elementary doctrines, so I've had to summarize all of them in this short time. But I believe they show you how, this shows you how important these are. Especially I know if all of you are believers, you have received the first one, baptism into the body of Christ, baptism into Jesus, into Christ. And baptism in the Holy Ghost, very important for you as a believer to live a life of power, to be a witness carrying power. This is why we are moving around the nation with the program Ignite Kenya. We're just getting Christians getting them filled by the power of the Holy Ghost to see them impact their places. And we are charging the pastors now to teach them the word because we are telling the pastors just that these people are filled with the Holy Ghost, they are prophesying, they are seeing healings, it doesn't mean they are mature. But it is good fire that you can use in the church. Don't quench it, just teach them. Guide them in doctrine now that they are on fire for God. Then... So now we are going to Kisumu. Because I realize this, especially as we go around evangelizing, you're going to realize that many Kenyans are born again, but many of them are not, especially soul winning. I think soul winning has not been taught. Many people don't go out soul winning. We are very comfortable, but soul winning was the great commission that we were given. It is for all of us. It is for all of us. So this is very important, and I believe that all of you should desire this and want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And if you've not been baptized in water, you've had uh, next Sunday, we will be baptizing people. After this service, register. Register, get an usher and tell them, I want to register for baptism. Register. Uh, register today. Come, be water baptized on that Sunday. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Have we been blessed? Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for everyone that came today. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you want us established in the elementary doctrines of Christ that you want us to move on to perfection. You want us to move on to maturity. But there is no way we can move on to maturity if the foundational truths have not been established. As your children in this ministry, let everyone be so grounded in the elementary doctrines. We talked about repentance from dead works, laying on of hands, um, faith toward God. Now we've talked about baptisms and that the remaining, that everyone will know them at their fingertips and that it will be a very great foundation for whatever you want to do in them. Thank you, Father, even for anyone that is in this place and maybe they've never experienced your power. They've never experienced a real touch of the Holy Ghost. Give them an experience. Holy Spirit, touch them. Let them experience the reality of who you are. That these will not just be stories to them. Like you came to me, a 14-year-old boy, when the Christians around me thought I was unworthy to be touched by you. When people around me thought I was too bad for God. When I was told that you can't enter a dirty vessel, that there may be people here that feel that way or they felt that way. I pray that you give them an experience. Fill them with your Holy Ghost. Even those that have been filled with the Holy Ghost and maybe quenched Him in a certain way. 
that they are not fervent as they used to be. The fire is not burning as it used to burn. Let there be an ignition among these that are here. Right now. Right now. Those things that happened to me that have happened to others, shake them. Shake their legs. Fill them with laughter. Let your love, like liquid love, fall upon them. Let them experience a love like they've never experienced. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. From the left to the right, touch them. Touch everyone desiring a fresh touch. Ignite a fire. Ignite a fire. Ignite a fire. Ignite a fire in us. Ignite a fire in us. Let your wind blow all over them. Yes, that they shall be witnesses. Witnesses unto you. That they shall carry your power. They shall carry your glory. They will carry your glory. Touch them. Touch them. Holy Ghost. Feel them afresh. A fresh touch. To burn and burn on and burn on for you. To burn on and on and on and on and on and on. Yes. That they will be very pivotal in this that you are doing in this nation. What you are doing in Kenya. That they will be very pivotal. People that will be carriers of God. People that shall never bow to sickness. That we will have manifestations in this generation. Manifestations that have been so absent in the body of Christ in Kenya. Things that have not been so common that I just read about in the Bible. Yes, Pratalaba, a new fire, a fresh touch. Right now, from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet, like he fell on the apostles on the day of Pentecost, fall afresh on us. Fall afresh on them. In the name of Jesus, that they will be carriers of your glory. Insight into scripture, insight that can never come from just reading. Insight that comes by the anointing of God. Like they had Peter quote scriptures, they had him speak with boldness, and they realized he was an unlearned man. That Father, that you've called them to preach, to speak your word. That your anointing comes upon them right now. An anointing to speak your word with such clarity and accuracy. And their testimony will be, God touched me. God touched my life. He changed my life. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you. Miracles, signs and wonders. Miracles, signs and wonders. Those you've called for miracles, signs and wonders. Miracle signs and wonders. Those that used to win souls and grew cold, that they will hit the streets again. They will go to different places again and win souls again. And win souls again. Let your fire burn in them. Let it flow like a river. Let it flow like a river. Let it flow like a river. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, that they will be so expectant of what you have. So expectant, especially concerning what you've called them to do. In the mighty name of Jesus. There are three people. The power of God is touching your feet right now. God has called you for the nations and God is going to take you to nations and you may go as a profession to that nation. You may not go as a preacher. You will go in the line of work. But don't forget that God has called you. That God is sending you there. Your work is just an air ticket. 
Your work is the is, your work gives you entry. Right now, the power of God is touching you. Three people, God is touching you. You're going. God is sending you to nations. He's sending you to different nations, and you will preach the gospel. You will preach the gospel in those nations. Take it in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Liga pahayada. Ele tori balada. Brato lima shandelika. Ora mama mama rekosha katalaka. Thank you, Father. We give you glory.